Everybody, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you may be. Uh, welcome back to our Shangshung UK Institute uh, lecture series. Today, we're very happy to welcome Mark Henry de Roche, who's an associate professor at Kyoto University in Japan, and he's teaching Buddhist studies there. He studied in Paris at the Ecole Pratique des Autitudes, and he got his PhD there. And there's a publication forthcoming about it. And he's very interested in the Rime movement, the non-sectarian movement, uh, which happened in Eastern Tibet, and especially in philosophy and um, mindfulness from a Tibetan perspective. So we're going to today really look at the roots, historical roots, rather than the more modern mindfulness we often hear about. We can actually see and hear a bit about the real historical context and the great masters behind it. So we're very happy to have you today, Mark. And um, we'll have questions at the end, about 15 minutes. So if you have any questions that come up to mind, you can either write them in the chat or just keep them for later and then ask Mark. And uh, thank you, everybody, and welcome, Mark. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Jamin, for your kind invitation. This is a great pleasure to today to share this uh, uh, research about uh, the, the Rampa or mindfulness in the Tibetan tradition and especially according to the masters of the Nyingma lineage. So let me now share the, the PowerPoint I have prepared for, um, for this. Yeah, so we will be talking about mindfulness or rather this uh, term Drenpa uh, in Tibetan and uh, look at it from the perspectives of, uh, of the different authors of the Nyingma lineage and especially from the uh, let's say the Dzogchen horizon. So I hesitated today to, to uh, just uh, say, for example, perspective from the Dzogchen tradition, because I want to talk uh, about the whole path of, uh, of uh, the Nyingma tradition, including Dzogchen and oriented toward Dzogchen. So this is uh, the idea of this talk. So let me just uh, uh, share the outline. So uh, Jamyang asked me not to be too academic. So I promised I will be academic, but practice this oriented academic, so scholarship that can be useful for a practical uh, approach. So this is uh, our, our, our agreement, let's say, with, with Jamion. So we started with the, uh, talking about mindfulness, wisdom, and compassion, and, and try to, to define briefly mindfulness and also make some distinctions about what we hear today about mindfulness and what I'm going to talk uh, uh, precisely today. So then I would like to explain how mindfulness has been defined in Indian Mahayana Buddhism. And this would form the common foundations to all schools. So even if I label this uh, talk uh, uh, with a Nima a tradition, I do not intend to be sectarian at all. Uh, so this will be the, the common foundations. But then the idea is to be precise and it's much easier to just focus on one tradition that has its coherent uh, set of categories. So then we will move uh, to mindfulness in the progressive path of the Nyingma school and especially look at Longchen Pa's uh, trilogy of rest. That is Dzogchen oriented, but that covers the whole uh, path from uh, Sutra to Tantra to Dzogchen. And then we will look more precisely at the Dzogchen level. Uh, this is what uh, uh, Jig Nyingpa actually calls the distinctive mindfulness of Dzogchen, and we will just follow uh, this author. And in conclusion, I would like to reflect a bit on uh, Chigen Namkai Nobu's foundational teachings. Um, since he is the founder of the Shangshu Institute, I will pay a special tribute to his, uh, to his teachings and, and legacy. Okay, so uh, now to summarize the whole talk, basically I have a, a quote by Patrul Rinpoche on mindfulness, he writes, the root of all means that discipline the mind is only mindfulness. So this is a very strong statement. So the, the emphasis on mindfulness is not just a modern uh, uh, movement. It is really in the Tibetan tradition itself. And then Patrul Rinpoche gives us three aspects or three types of mindfulness that we will today uh, explore. First, it is a deliberate mindfulness. Sometimes this Jordan is translated as tight mindfulness, so it's kind of intentional uh, dualistic mindfulness. In the middle, it is an expanse. So this refers 
rather to the relaxed approach of Dzogchen meditation. And finally, it is non-mindfulness, Bren Me in Tibetan, the state of clear light. So we will move from dual mindfulness to non-dual mindfulness and in the end beyond mindfulness. So this is very much how uh, the concept of mindfulness has been um, approached in the Nyingma school. So here Patrick Rinpoche gives us uh, the perfect overview, so to speak. So as we've seen with this quote, it's not new to make a very strong emphasis on mindfulness. This is actually what uh, Patrul Rinpoche is doing here. And we will see some Indian roots for, for that. But it's also not new that mindfulness is a buzzword. So even Jigme Lingpa in the uh, 18th century wrote those rather critical or polemical uh, uh, words. He wrote, now the Dharma terms, mindfulness, mindfulness, are the topic of conversation by ignorant people about their stupid meditation. So you see, even in the 18th century, a Dokshin master or Nyingma master would say such very strong uh, comments. Of course, this is in a text that I'm going to talk uh, about today. Uh, and of course, it's not just being uh, only critical, but this I think is quite uh, uh, funny uh, and, and interesting. And uh, so to avoid uh, personally talking about my own stupid meditation, I will rather focus on uh, what the ancient masters have said. So there will be today in this talk many, many quotes. So this is not about my experience at all, my stupid meditation experience at all. This is about what the master said, and I will try to convey their message in the most uh, precise way. So let's uh, uh, um, have some more uh, um, reflections on, on the contemporary notion of, of contemporary construct of mindfulness. So I would like to start with a very simple definition and, we, and it will evolve uh, uh, along the talk. I would like to define mindfulness as presence of mind. And actually Chuge Namke Norbu or, and his translators were uh, choosing rather presence. I've been, I've been choosing presence for mindfulness rather than mindfulness. I love very, very much this word that I found in the, in the works of this uh, late 19th and early 20th uh, century in France, Janet, he has this word of presentification that for him is kind of the core cognitive faculty. So I think it's quite nice actually to, to mention that. So for me, mindfulness, and according to the Indian and Tibetan tradition, it is a faculty. It's a faculty closely related to the network of executive functions, as it is called now in modern psychology especially working memory, but also executive attention. So we'll see this connection between memory and attention that is extremely important and difficult to understand what mindfulness is in the Buddhist psychology. So such faculty can be trained with techniques, so meditation techniques, along the path of self-transformation that lead to states of experience and stages of realization, and that can change actually traits of personalities. I just wanted to to, to make those, uh, to, to provide those clear notions because sometimes mindfulness is, uh, is, is, uh, is a way of life, is, is everything in the end. So here I'm talking about mindfulness as a faculty that is to be trained uh, in the Buddhist path. So now a clear distinction between Buddhist teachings on mindfulness as a core element of the Buddhist spiritual path concerned with this life and next lives until complete awakening and two, globalized, secularized, medicalized, mindfulness-based programs, as they are called, addressing health issues such as stress, anxiety, depression, addiction, trauma, and focused on well-being in this life only. So by saying this, uh, uh, actually, I, uh, there is no uh, uh, critique of the, of the second one, actually, uh, but it's very important to have this clear uh, distinction. And in a sense, uh, when mindfulness-based programs are directed and prepared by medical doctors and psychologists, they can be very, very useful. And I have actually a, a lot of interest in them, uh, a lot of respect and, uh, and uh, really appreciation for all the work that's being done. Um, because when we deal about stress in the modern world, anxiety, depression, et cetera, we need sometimes some specific, some specialist, and, and so sometimes if I'm actually, uh, most of the time, um, doctors, psychologists that provide those uh, interventions are excellent. So, so, 
And uh, so this is uh, the distinction that we like to make. Um, but it doesn't mean that I'd like, I, I want to uh, um, look down on those, on those approaches. On the other hand, I think they are very, very important. And as uh, today we'll be concerned mainly with the Buddhist past, but the Buddhist past in Buddhist past in this life and next life starts in this life, right? So we have also to deal with problems in this life. And in this, in this end, I think that mindfulness-based programs can be very, very good. There's being said, uh, that can be also articulated according to the Mahayana Buddhist perspective. So from, uh, which is wisdom and compassion basically. So the Buddhist framework for mindfulness can be seen as wisdom oriented. And today we'll talk a lot about wisdom and awakening and Ligpa. But on the other hand, secular mindfulness based programs can be considered and are considered in many Buddhist communities actually as an appropriate compassionate activity. So a lot of those interventions were also developed or inspired by the dialogues between scientists and his holiness of the Dalai Lama in the Mind and Life Institute. So in many ways, from a Buddhist perspective and the perspective of this uh, lecture is Buddhist, uh, those uh, interventions can be very, very uh, appropriate as skillful means and compassionate activity. There is tremendous suffering in this, in our age. And those programs, when they are well done, informed by the Buddhist tradition and uh, prepared and organized by uh, scientists and psychologists can be excellent. The problem nevertheless comes when secular mindfulness-based programs are reduced to a purely profit-oriented approach, devoid of ethical references, cut from a living transmission, mixing various traditions, and this is actually a subtle problem and a very important problem, and confusing different levels and categories. So I'm not saying that this is uh, 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 mostly the case, but this is an important problem. So then the goal of this presentation is to recontextualize mindfulness in the entire Buddhist path, ethics, meditation, and wisdom, and not only meditation. So most of the time, mindfulness in, in, in uh, our contemporary period has been very much constructed in the context of meditation and how we can implement meditation in different uh, uh, new contexts like school, hospital, etc. But we will see that actually this covers really the entire path from the very beginning. So, uh, so we will do this. And according to one specific tradition with a coherent set of categories, that is enigma tradition of Tibetan Buddhism. And especially because it offers a very clear integration of various levels of teachings or vehicles. So you may be familiar with the notion of nine vehicles, for example, up to Dzogchen. So what we will see according to this tradition is that mindfulness is very used in a reverential approach. And I would like to contrast this uh, approach that is self-transcending, so to speak, uh, beyond the ego, um, with a rather instrumental approach that is more self-interested. And this is really striking when we look at the uh, Tibetan Buddhist literature, especially of this tradition, uh, mindfulness is, is highly reverential. And is as we will see here. So as I said in the beginning, I would like to really uh, uh, pay a tribute to Chögyal Namkai Nau Budin Poche. Um, for example, in this text that was translated as the Mirror Advice on Present and Awareness, uh, it was published in, in 1977. So really before the so-called uh, uh, mindful movement, uh, he really uh, very insightfully uh, summarized the key point of presence and awareness, as we will see. So I'd like just to uh, pay a tribute to him and, and uh, uh, consider that really core aspects of his teachings could be maybe summarized in those four points, basically presence and awareness to be practiced in all situations. Then the Guru Yoga as the main uh, method actually, and then instant presence that is actually discovering one's own real nature. And it, in a sense, it is beyond ordinary presence and awareness, but the link is uh, 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 through Guru Yoga. So through Guru Yoga, there is this possibility of discovering instant presence, which is in Tibetan Rikpa uh, Ketchikma. And then to uh, discover this instant presence, then to sustain it and to stabilize it. And this is what uh, Nam Karanobu uh, Linpoche referred many times to grid contemplation, Tignitzin 
Koluk Chenpo uh, in all circumstances. So in order to integrate this instant presence in all circumstances, there is a need to constantly uh, 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 come back to presence and awareness. So this forms really the solid ground uh, uh, of the past as presented by Chigen Nam Kainabu in Pachim. Um, for those who really want to uh, have a more academic approach on this, I'd like to recommend this very um, interesting book called In the Mirror of Memory. So in this book, they rather translated Drenpa or Smriti in Sanskrit as we will see as memory, and we will see why. And for them, memory includes mindfulness and remembrance. So we, we will see why. And there is especially a, a major paper on Drenpa or mindfulness memory by Matthew Caption in the context of Dzogchen. It's extremely interesting. It's called The Amnesic Monarch and the Five Mnemic Men, Memory and Great Perfection, Dzogchen Thought. So for those who really want to go deep in pure Dzogchen uh, materials, this is, extra, uh, this is a very interesting paper based on uh, Therma of the Northern tradition, that is Jong Ter. And this was very much inspired by uh, the discussion Matthew Kapstein had with uh, Tulku Organ in uh, in Nepal. Now, why uh, we can talk about uh, a memory? Uh, and I'd like to, to make two references to the Western tradition to uh, give us maybe some, um, before we move. Uh, into the Indian and Tibetan tradition to look at our own Western tradition and to discover, in order to discover a potential or potential um, um, equivalence of what uh, Drenpa or mindfulness can be. And actually, uh, uh, I will we'll see that Drenpa or mindfulness is rather memory, but memory not understood only as recollection of the past. So this is not a new uh, idea, actually. Uh, uh, in his Confessions, Book 10 and 11, St. Augustine extends the scope of memoria beyond the sole recollection of past experiences to what is actually present in the mind, especially moral and intellectual truths, self-knowledge, and ultimately the very presence of God. Memoria offering thus the access to being present to God or pure presence. So, this is, of course, extremely deep in our own uh, uh, Western history. And actually, even before uh, the Christian uh, uh, tradition, in the Greek tradition, uh, memory was actually uh, um, understood as the mother of the nine muses in Greek mythology and religion. So she's called Nemosine or Nemosune. So in this way, memory is the mother of sciences, arts, and learning. And actually, in the esoteric uh, Orphic mysteries, uh, Nemosine was the divine power enabling Fuck. the exit from time Fuck. and access to the secret of the origins. So actually, this is extremely, uh, uh, there are many, many deep uh, uh, teachings on, on, on memory in this tradition. So I have only a French reference to, to, to give right now. It's called uh, La mémoire et l'oubli dans la pensée grecque jusqu'à la fin du 5e siècle avant Jésus-Christ. So here, memory, of course, has nothing to do with actually uh, uh, remembrance of past experiences. And, and there is a constant uh, uh, dialectical relation between um, uh, forgetting what is actually not important, what is actually mundane, in order to remember our divine nature. And, and most of the time, in our, in our common uh, uh, state, this is the opposite. We've, we have forgotten our divine nature, our pure nature, and we constantly have in mind uh, mundane or um, uh, we could say samsaric uh, uh, issues. So this is actually very the switch, and the switch was very much the central topic of the initiation um, in in those mysteries. And I would like just to make one more uh, a comment about that. Uh, uh, it's also in the in the Orphic and and the, uh, uh, other Greek traditions. Uh, it's through Nemosine or Nemosune that uh, the initiate can remember past lives and thus not make the same mistake, not falling again and again and again in the same traps. So this idea of remembering past lives is very, very much central. And actually, mindfulness in the Indian and Tibetan tradition 
is also concerned with remembering past lives. So after several years of considering uh, this topic of mindfulness, I think that the best equivalent uh, uh, of mindfulness in the Western tradition is probably Nemosign. Okay, so now let's go deep into the Indian and uh, Tibetan tradition. And looks, let's look uh, first at Indian Ma Mahayana and thus the common foundations to all Tibetan schools. Um, so mindfulness and awareness. So now I will talk about mindfulness and awareness. Uh, and this is what uh, Chigel Namkai Nobu was translating as presence and, and awareness. So in, in Mahayana, the, the, uh, and especially for Tibetans, uh, the main source to distinguish them and define them is the Abhidharma uh, traditions of Asanga and Vasubandhu. So we have a Smriti Drenpa. This is what we translate as mindfulness or presence. And it has really the function of memory, of retention, and non distraction. Then we have Samprajanya, it is Sheshi in Tibetan, and it is awareness, or we could say meta awareness, because it is really. Uh, 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 a form of metacognition, actually, of being aware of how we are aware. And this is why we can also translate it as clear comprehension, adequate assessment, assessment, and also introspection sometimes, like checking one's own mind, as we will see. Both those notions are sometimes uh, combined in Smriti Samprajanya or Drenpa Tangsheshin or Drenche is contracted as Drenche in the Tibetan tradition. And this is basically mindful awareness. And in uh, in this way, it is integrating practically both aspects. So as we will see from a practical point of view, Smriti and Samprajanya or Drenpa and Sheshin, they are, they are combined in practically speaking. And in the Pali tradition, so today I only focus on the Mahayana tradition and the Tibetan uh, uh, successors. Uh, the distinction is very, uh, very um, important between the two, but in the Pali sources, especially early sources, it seems the two were very much the two sides of the same coin, but I will let uh, 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 this question to, to Pali scholars. But what I can say is, about, is that for the Indian Mayan tradition, practically speaking, as we will see, they are also very much combined. And here, uh, when they are combined, uh, um, of course, the direct experience, uh, uh, checking, you know, having, having this immediate awareness of one's own mind, of one's own experience is quite central. So this doesn't have here in this context then the function of really remembering or memorizing. But Drenpa or mindfulness can have also this, this aspect when it is distinguished specifically. So there are also many, many other mental factors in, in Mahayana psychology. Uh, I won't uh, enter into too much details today, but just to mention one more, we have uh, Manasikara, which can be actually translated as attention. So my point here is that mindfulness is not attention. Those are really two different uh, uh, concepts. Uh, uh, um, if we translate it in this way, actually, and I would say that mindfulness is rather what will lead attention, actually, what will uh, uh, direct attention um, or mental engagement. But let's uh, uh, move now to a more uh, practical approach. And uh, the core sources for, for uh, uh, talking about mindfulness and awareness in Mahayana is actually Shantideva's Bodhicharya Avatara. And uh, it is quoted constantly by Long Chenpa or Jigme Lingpa. So I will today share a few quotes. Uh, and this will clearly, for those who know uh, Chögen Namkan Nobu Rinpoche's uh, book on presence, you will see that uh, this is very, very um, uh, similar. Uh, because this is the tradition on which Chigenam uh, Kainabu uh, in Pochi is basing himself, actually. So we have here in this chapter five called Guarding Awareness. And this has a very strong ethical implication. Uh, so, therefore, this, my mind, should be well held and well guarded, except for the vow of guarding the mind, what to do with many vows. So here is not saying that we should not have any other vow than just guarding the mind. He's saying is that all the monastic vows because he was a monk and all the bodhisattvas vows because he was also trained in the, in the Mahayana tradition can only be uh, maintained if 
we can maintain our own minds. So this is what he's really saying. So uh, mindfulness and awareness are the very foundation of ethics. So this is why now he's exhorting uh, uh, the, the readers. Uh, to those who wish to guard their mind, I join the palms of my hands saying, with all your efforts, guard mindfulness and awareness. Then when one wishes to move or one wishes to speak, first one should examine one's own mind and then act firmly with intelligence. So here we have the idea of examining the mind and this is actually the very definition of awareness. Again and again, examining the states of one's mind and body, this alone is in some the definition of guarding awareness. So here we have really the two functions of uh, mindfulness and awareness clearly connected to this exercise that was also very important in uh, Greek and Christian traditions, the examination of conscience. Regularly, am I doing okay? Am I on the right tracks? Just like the self-check regular, but uh, uh, not, uh, um, yeah, regular. So Long Shen Pa and, and Jig Mining Pa will also uh, tell uh, us a similar uh, advice. <clears throat> then uh, I won't read the whole list. Then we have the, the list of the 37 branches of awakening. So uh, this list is extremely important to describe uh, the whole Mariana Pass. Uh, uh, not only Mariana, but Mariana authors use it uh, uh, very much. So I just wanted to uh, highlight the point that mindfulness is present in many, many places. So this is why when we talk about mindfulness in the Indian uh, Mahayana tradition, it's really, a, 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 it has a very important role at many, many moments of the past. So what I would like to uh, 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 emphasize uh, is the very beginning of the past, the very beginning of the Mahayana past uh, in this model is the, the so-called four applications of mindfulness. So you might, um, many of you must be familiar with it. Uh, this is the mindfulness of the body or application of mindfulness to the body, application of mindfulness to feelings, application, application of mindfulness to the mind, and application of mindfulness to dharma or the, to the teachings. So this is, of course, quite famous because, uh, as you might know, the whole modern uh, uh, mindfulness movement, and not only secular, but also Buddhist and in the Theravada tradition, starts with a rediscovery of the Satipatthana Sutta, which is basically the, the, the core text on, on those four uh, uh, notions. And it is a very practical text, a very essential text. Uh, so, but this is also, of course, known uh, in the Mayana tradition and uh, in its Tibetan successors. So this is why we have this famous quote by Nagarjuna. It is very often, uh, uh, quoted by, by Nyingma authors. So he says, Nagarjuna says, Lord is, is speak, speaking to a king. The Buddha talked mindfulness applied to the body as a single path to progress. This hold fast and guard it well for all the Dharma is destroyed by the loss of mindfulness. So here, uh, mindfulness applied to the body is the very first exercise in the Mahayana past, actually. So I think this is really interesting um, because we have a spiritual tradition that emphasizes the need in order to progress spiritually to embody the mind, basically, to bring uh, 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 dignity, grace, and presence to one's own physical existence. And this is considered as being the very foundation of the past. So I think this is highly interesting. And if this is missing, then there is no more Dharma anymore. There is no more past anymore. So I think this is very, very uh, uh, beautiful. So now I'd like to, to, uh, to look at the gnostic uh, uh, nature of, of the application of mindfulness. So Vasubandhu in his Abhidharma Kosha, he actually defines the essence of the applications of mindfulness as being the threefold wisdom. So I will explain. Uh, um, 
a progressive study, reflection, and practice. So he writes, then what is the nature of the applications of mindfulness? Regarding this question, as for the application of mindfulness, in its nature, it is wisdom. So here it is really a wisdom-oriented model. How is wisdom? It is born from study, etc. Then he repeats, it is born from study, born from reflection, and born from practice. The applications of mindfulness also have three aspects born from study, from reflection, and from practice. And this is why I suggest that we can see the three aspects of mindfulness of presence according to the threefold wisdom. We can consider mindfulness at the level of wisdom born from study as keeping the teachings present in mind. So when uh, one receives some teachings, then one has to maintain such te teachings in memory, basically. One has to remind them. And then at the level of wisdom born from reflection, we could consider mindfulness as adequate representation instead of our many, many confused notions or representations. And at the, level at the level of the wisdom born from practice, we have mindfulness as presence of mind. So I have published a, a full paper on, on discussing those ideas. So then when we put uh, this talk online, I, I, I hope we can uh, make the links to, to, to the paper for the people who want to uh, look at it more carefully. But uh, I think this, this quote by, by Vasubandhu is very interesting because we can see here the different facets of mindfulness that are sometimes being opposed. And in, in current mindfulness studies, I mean, academic studies, like in psychology, philosophy, and, and all, you know, interdisciplinary dialogue, it's very complicated to reconcile people who think that mindfulness is connected with memory, with uh, uh, reminding the teachings, or then with thinking and, and examining one's own mind, or other people who think that it's bare awareness, it's simply noticing, etc. more in the meditative context. So actually here we have a model that makes sense of the different facets. And of course, the most important is the wisdom born from practice. So people who uh, insist on, on meditation, in a sense, they are right, but uh, such meditation is also uh, uh, possible due uh, 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 on the firm basis of those two other aspects. So we have in this way, uh, mindfulness as keeping the teachings present in mind, mindfulness as adequate representation, and mindfulness as presence of mind. And we will see those different facets, especially when we look at Long Chen Pa's uh, trilogy of rest. We will clearly uh, see those different uh, aspects all together. So then um, what we call meditation is at this third level, wisdom born from practice. And there are, as you, most of you might know, there are two main uh, exercises in, in Buddhist meditation. There is uh, um, calm abiding, shamatha, and insight, vipassana. Shine and Laktong in Tibetan. And of course, the classical work for this in Tibet is Kamala Shila's Progressive Stages of Meditation, Bhavana Krama. So recently, uh, 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 our friend Antoine Lutz and his colleagues have uh, used um, new categories to make sense of those exercises. They, they uh, talk about focused attention for uh, shamatha and they talk about open monitoring for insight. But the point is that actually mindfulness and awareness, they are active at, at, at both levels, actually. They are uh, uh, important at both levels. In, in the context of shamatha, mindfulness keeps the mind focused on the object, and then meta-awareness checks whether there is distraction or not. So those are two aspects of being focused, basically. And in the context of uh, insight, mindfulness avoids attention to be carried away while meta-awareness investigates the field of experience and becomes wisdom. But in the ultimate sense, when wisdom is fully realized, there is no more mindfulness. So we will see this. Uh, 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 so mindfulness is to be completely transformed into wisdom. Uh, because uh, we will see, uh, 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 because mindfulness, even in, in a very subtle sense, as a conceptual nature, as a dualistic nature, 
according to this Mahayana framework, and it is to be completely uh, uh, transcended. So as you might know, shamatha leads to concentration and stages of meditative absorption, and vipassana leads to realizing emptiness, non-self, or ultimate truth. And there is no more mindfulness at this level. Okay, so now let's look at um, uh, Long Chen Pa, uh, and especially his, uh, his trilogy of rest. And this was also, uh, is based also on uh, a paper that I've published, so uh, all the references uh, can be found in this paper. Uh, so uh, there are, uh, uh, of course, we're, we're going to talk about the path of Dzogchen, basically, but in a progressive way, how we can approach, so to speak, uh, and Dzogchen. So there are two main levels of practice in Dzogchen, reorienting the mind with dual means or being settled in its non-dual nature, pure awareness. Those two dimensions are constantly intertwined because the Dzogchen path is to progressively integrate all experiences in the contemplation of pure awareness, but this is not so easy. So the recognition of pure awareness is quickly lost. Why? Because the cosmogonic drama of losing it uh, 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 and its recovery, in other words, forgetfulness and mindfulness are repeated over and over again on the path. Therefore, different roles of mindfulness are to convert the attention back to pure awareness and then to maintain it. So there are different aspects, dual and non-dual. And this is what we'll be talking about from now, basically, how those two aspects are connected. So I see uh, 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 there are three uh, uh, elements of converging attention through mindfulness in the trilogy of rest, reorienting the mind, purifying the mind of progressing in meditation, and then coming back to the nature of mind, pure awareness. So let's look at the first aspect. So in this first aspect, we will see that actually uh, there is an ethics of attention. So in order to control our mind or to control our attention, we need basically to uh, um, create a system in which, in, according to which it can be uh, uh, positively oriented. And this is very much uh, uh, what is uh, important at this level. So this is why we talk, uh, Long Chen talks at this level about renunciation, which is basically mind changers. This is sometimes uh, we talk about the four awarenesses. So the four mind changers, um, precious human life, impermanence and death, karma, and then the uh, imperfection of samsara. So here we see Long Chen making this you know, revolution of mind, basically, this mind revolution. He says, therefore, knowing all one's faults, one should from the bottom of the heart being mindful of the suffering of cyclic existence. Then, so that oneself and all beings become free from existence, one should ascend perfectly the path of peace. So we see here the word mindfulness at this very level to change the mind's direction, to offer a compass uh, uh, toward the right direction. Then uh, mindfulness, is, mindfulness of death is very much what we uh, used to know in the Western tradition as memento mori, remember that you will die. So Long Chen Pa laments about how sad is it that even if one has met the teachings of liberation, by not being mindful of death, one is deluded by the confusion of this life that is perceived as permanent. Or how sad is it that even if one has obtained, sorry, there's a typo here, the precious human body by not being mindful of death, one dies in the prison within which one transmigrates again and again. So mindfulness of death. So as here we clearly see we are at a clearly uh, uh, conceptual and dualistic level but the switch is very important to operate. Then following the teacher, self-observation and self-control. So also mindfulness is very important and Long Chen Pai exhorts us, one must constantly be mindful of the qualities of the teacher. Actually, it is in this chapter uh, uh, that it discuss a conscientiousness or carefulness, mindfulness and awareness about how to follow a teacher. So. Uh, mindfulness and awareness and behaving carefully, politely, uh, uh, with dignity is discussed by Long Chen Pa uh, as the core skills in order to follow a teacher. And actually, this is true following a teacher that those qualities can be become uh, more and more firm in the mind. But I think this is extremely interesting 
to see that mindfulness somehow uh, um, uh, is uh, central in order to follow a teacher, but also to learn to observe oneself. And then, of course, going for refuge is, is, is linked with mindfulness. Um, being mindful of the three jewels, Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, during the whole cycle of day and night, or six, three, or at least one time a day, go to them for refuge and following them accomplish virtues. So the very act of remembering uh, uh, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha is um, rooted in mindfulness, according to Long Chenpa. Same for the uh, awakening mind, Bodhicitta, being mindful of the qualities of the three jewels and reflecting with the thought, may I to obtain such a state for the sake of beings, one join the palms of the hands. So even the generation of, of, of bodhicitta is uh, linked with such a conceptual type of, of mindfulness. And this is, of course, to be constantly, uh, 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 the practitioner is has to constantly uh, um, remind uh, a refuge in bodhicitta. It's not something that is done uh, once for all. It's, it's, it's constant practice, uh, as we saw just before, uh, uh, several times uh, uh, a day and several times at night as well. Same for bodhicitta, actually. This, this is the same idea. Um, and then, uh, constantly through mindfulness, vigilance, and conscientiousness, negativities are removed and vast virtues are accomplished. So uh, uh, mindfulness and, and awareness are here also to recognize uh, negative mental states and then to apply antidotes. So again, we are the dualistic, antidotal, and conceptual type of mindfulness, but extremely important and foundational. So then this is a very important passage, especially in our modern digital world, a reform of lifestyle, avoiding distraction and choosing meaning. So Long Chen Pav writes, Distractions and diversions are the deceptive seductions of Mara, you know, the, the devil in, in, in Buddhist tradition. It is important not to let one's own mind be deceived by them and to apply oneself to spiritual practice. Desires lead to bad destinies and block the way to happy ones because desires they are limitless. Uh, 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 when one is satisfied, another uh, pops up. So lessen your desires and be endowed with contentment. And the word uh, contentment in, uh, in, uh, in Tibetan, in Chinese too, actually means knowing what is enough. I think it's very, very interesting. Identify your vital needs and just be happy when they are satisfied. And more than that is just desire. It's not a need, it's a desire. So this is what contentment it is, knowing what is enough. And then he also writes, for progress in meditation, it is important to integrate it with one's lifestyle. So we have a very interesting uh, um, uh, advice about this uh, idea of aligning meditation and lifestyle. Uh, so I must say that sometimes I'm a bit puzzled uh, because when I think about uh, Long Chen Pa's, uh, you know, uh, Tibetan culture in, in 14th century Tibet, it was a very, very simple lifestyle, right, compared to us. But still, uh, he was writing such powerful statements. So what would he say if he, were, if he was uh, living in our 21st uh, information age or digital age? So I think his, his, uh, his advice is very important. Uh, 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 and knowing that actually, uh, sometimes he also writes that contentment is the uh, highest happiness, actually. So let's look at uh, how uh, mindfulness is now uh, operating in, in meditation, in purifying the mind. Now that the mind has been reoriented, it can be more fully uh, um, purified. So of course, focusing the mind is all uh, uh, done with mindfulness. The mind is focused and held with mindfulness. This is a really uh, uh, the central definition in the context of, of meditation. Uh, and then again, we have this idea of recognizing and converting defilements through antidotes. He writes, immediately when the five poisons arise in one's own mind, or sorry, stream of consciousness, one should silence them with mindfulness and without distraction rely upon antidotes. For example, the antidotes of uh, anger is loving kindness, and etc. etc. So mindfulness is very connected with the, with, the, uh, 
with recognizing, so remembering actually the, the core categories of the teachings, remembering what is a defilement, remembering what is an antidote, and recognizing uh, them when they, when they arise, and remembering to apply the antidotes. So maybe uh, to give a few uh, more examples here, um, uh, anger is, uh, the antidote of anger is loving kindness. The antidote of attachment is compassion, for example, like, considering the suffering of other beings can lessen our attachments. Then the antidote uh, uh, to jealousy is, uh, is joy, actually rejoicing in the virtues and happiness of others. And then the antidote of both uh, pride and uh, stupidity, so to speak, or ignorance is equanimity. So this is something that is very beautifully explained in this work by, uh, by Long Chenpa. Then uh, uh, even the two phases of tantric practice also could be uh, very much seen from the perspective of mindfulness. So the phase of creation means transforming defiled perception into pure vision. And there is a very important link with the idea of recollecting the Buddha, reminding the Buddha, uh, visualizing the, the image of the Buddha that is actually a practice that is also present in sutra uh, teachings. But this is very much, uh, uh, the tantric uh, phase of creation is very much the expansion of this uh, uh, of this practice. And then uh, this is, uh, um, again, a, a parallel I see with the ancient Western tradition, um, very much, especially in very uh, elaborated uh, tantric practice. Uh, there is the organization of all, all categories of Buddhist uh, teachings within the mandala uh, of the deity. And I see a very uh, interesting parallel with the ancient uh, Ars Memoria, you know, uh, uh, mnemic, uh, um, devices that were developed uh, during the Renaissance and that were um, based on imagining um, a palace and classifying a lot of information in different rooms and, and, and et cetera, et cetera. So we are here, um, a similar idea. Then the phase of perfection, mining the wind. And this is uh, uh, through which uh, karmic energy is transformed into uh, wisdom energy. But let's look now uh, uh, at uh, basically uh, dream yoga and the preparation from dream yoga. And this is something Shigen Namke Norbu Rinpoche also used to, to teach a lot. So Long Chenpa writes up during the day, apprehend all activities of moving, resting, eating, walking, or talking with undistracted mindfulness, thinking it is in a dream. So we see here also mindfulness to be very important or presence. Then the practice of the night is also centered on mindfulness. In the heart, one should visualize a white A ah, like a crystal ball blazing light, the size of a thumb, the mind fixed on its subtler and subtler state, be undistracted with the mindfulness that it is like a dream. In this way, dreamlike clear light will arise during sleep. And then at the beginning of the practice, if you have terrifying nightmares, remind, and actually this is again the, the word for mindfulness, that there are dreams and your fear will be liberated in its own place. And here we see now a connection between presence and instant presence in Chögen Namka Nampu's terms of mindfulness, Drenpa, and pure awareness, Ligpa. By training us with mindfulness all day and night, Thus, the qualities of pure awareness implied in this way will be made manifest without deception from this application of the key points of practice. This is the most profound essential vehicle. So now we see the transition to Dzogchen. And this is coming back to the nature of my pure awareness. So of course, the direct introduction to the teacher is very important and there is uh, some um, um, instructions given in Long Chen and past works, uh, such as injunction to look at apparent objects, recognizing them as empty, illusory, mere reflections on a mirror, but then attention is directed to the subject itself. The man's soul consciousness distinguishing such appearances in order to experience that the nature of mind is like the sky. So there is a uh, 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 this uh, presentation of the teacher that has the effect of turning back uh, the mind to its own root. 
So uh, I, I, I mentioned at the beginning that it's the context of Dzogchen. We are in a reverential context. So this is very clear in Longchen Pass Bracking. And the recognition of Rigpa is due to a synergy of efforts by the practitioner and blessings. So Longchen Pav writes, although Rigpa is always present, the experience of pure awareness is made only by a few who are filled with the blessings of the teacher. Its nature is self-illuminating and objectless. So here we are beyond concepts and beyond duality. So then uh, there is a, a very important, once this uh, uh, pure awareness has been recognized, then the question is how it can be preserved. Uh, so in later, in a later uh, author's works, uh, we have the idea of preserving pure awareness through mindfulness. This is a very important topic. Uh, in Long Chen Pa's works, we don't see really uh, the word uh, mindfulness in this context, because for him, Mindfulness just belongs to the level of mind, and at the level of the nature of mind, it's beyond mindfulness. But nevertheless, of course, Long Chen Pa mentions this idea of preserving or continuing, uh, cultivating this recognition. So he writes about the experience of preserving the self-recognition, state of pure awareness, that the pure awareness free from limitations emerges like the continuity of a river, or one should preserve penetratingly and openly the naturally settled and naturally flowing state. So sometimes uh, other translators think that the translation of uh, Kyung as preserve is a bit strong because it has a bit uh, an implication of an effort. And here we are in a rather effortless context. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I think that the, the, the term in Tibetan is, is quite strong and uh, such a state can be easily lost and there is clearly a very uh, clear presence that has to sustain it. So all those different levels are uh, here uh, summarized. So we saw uh, reorienting the mind with an effortful mindfulness. Then we have considered mastering the mind again with an effortful mindfulness and meditation. And then in the end, we have seen how uh, Long Chen Pa has discussed uh, the recognition of the nature of mind in and in this context, it's it is an effortful mindfulness, or even it's beyond mindfulness actually, uh, uh, stricto sensu. It's, so it's in a sense it's non meditation or non mindfulness. But now we will move to uh, Jigme Ningpa, and Jigme Ningpa, uh, 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 in the context of Dzogchen, uh, has very interesting uh, um, expressions. Uh, um, and in, in this way, he's, he's as other, uh, he has another approach. And he talks about the distinctive mindfulness of Dzogchen. And of course, this mindfulness is non-dual and non-conceptual. So he has a very beautiful uh, language in his works. Uh, so this is uh, also a publication that I have um, uh, been working on with my colleague at the uh, University of Virginia, Michael Sheehy. And this will be available soon. And when we will be... Um, um, uploading this video, I think it will be already published. So uh, there is this uh, interesting book by uh, Ban Sam Van Shaik uh, in order to articulate uh, uh, in Jing Meaning Past Text and uh, the different methods. Uh, so articulating those who, uh, that are gradual, Lim Gipa, and those who, uh, that are simultaneous. And this is a very important uh, problem as we have seen uh, in Long Chen Pa's works. But I would like to argue uh, today that mindfulness is actually the crux, uh, is actually the core problem uh, uh, in order to make these distinctions and also to make the shift. And again, Jigme Lingpa has a very interesting language to explore those dimensions. Uh, but again, let's talk about ethics, but this time in the context of Tantra and Dzogchen. So this is what uh, Jigme Lingpa writes. Not to know the line of the downfalls, not to respect one's teacher, to be habituated to carelessness, to have strong defilements are the four doors from which originate downfalls. Added to this, added to greed forgetfulness and unclear mindfulness, these are the six causes for the corruption of Samaya. So basically, forgetfulness and mindfulness uh, and, the low, the, and the loss of mindfulness, sorry, are the causes for um, 
corrupting or deteriorating one's own samayas, which are extremely important, of course, in the context of Tantra and Dzogchen. And the antidotes to that are mindfulness and awareness. So this is also a very uh, strong point. So Jim Ningpa writes, therefore, the antidotes are mindfulness and awareness, like guarding the carefulness of a doctor operating a blind person in the six periods of day and night, examine yourself while holding again and again the points of what is to be abandoned and what is to be adopted. So my translation is a bit rigid because I try to be very close to the Tibetan text. But what he's saying basically is uh, uh, like a Shantideva in the context of the Sutra here in the context of Tantra and Dzogchen, he's saying that it is important to cultivate mindfulness and awareness and examine uh, one's own conduct and uh, uh, one's own samaya, basically. Uh, uh, this is what it means by uh, what is to be abandoned and what is to be adopted. And here it is again in the context of Tantra. Okay, so I've been working uh, recently uh, with uh, Michael Sheehy on two texts uh, um, on mindfulness, very two short, interesting uh, discourses on mindfulness by Jimmy Ningpa. The one is called The Ocean of Qualities, Discourse on Mindfulness. It has already been translated by Tine Norbu. Um, and we are not translating this other one, uh, a cudgel to discern the real advice that shines from mindfulness and meta-awareness. And this will be available. Uh, so in the first one, Jing Lingpa is called the special teacher of instantaneous mindfulness of natural awareness. So this is a very beautiful expression, uh, clearly at the doctrine level. And he encourages renouncers, meditators, to ascertain all the Dharma terms and expressions of the past into the definition of mindfulness. So, yeah, so this is very, so actually this talk, uh, if you want, is very much uh, encouraged by such an advice. So trying to articulate all the key points of the past, all the uh, key notions of the Dharma in relation with mindfulness. And in this way, one will be able to meditate very, very uh, skillfully. But also in this text, uh, he clearly points at ultimate reality beyond mindfulness, especially according to the Prajna Paramita, ordinary mindfulness or memory is removed at the level of transcendent virtue of wisdom. He writes, here, the wisdom beyond the discursive intellect sees the nature of reality beyond mindfulness. He writes also, wisdom appears as the insight that exhausts the basis of mindfulness. Nevertheless, in the other text that we are not being translating, he he has actually two types of, of mindfulness. The one that is this conditioned mindfulness that disappears at the level of wisdom, and the other one that is the distinctive mindfulness of Dzogchen. So let's look at the condition, let's look at conditioned mindfulness first, Dujik Jenba. It is an applied mindfulness, or you could say deliberate. Uh, sometimes you, we could actually translate Jordan as tight mindfulness. Like, I have to be careful, I have to be careful. And this is even how he introduces it. And the such uh, a mindfulness is antidotal. So this is exactly what we have seen uh, 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 as such in Long Chen Ba's writings. And then also he talks about mindfulness as a cause and awareness as a result. Um, this refers to theories of meditation that um, explain that actually mindfulness keeps the, ob the, the objects so there is this concentration. And then due to that, there is little by little a capacity to observe one's own mind with more uh, clarity. So this is like cause and result. So, but in the context of Dzogchen, this model does not apply. And Jing Meningpa is very strong about that. So now let's look at this uh, distinctive mindfulness of Dzogchen. So it talks about it as naturally settled mindfulness of the nature of phenomena or the nature of reality. So it's also very beautiful. And so it talks about mindfulness akarikpa as a single medicine for 100 diseases. So it's a, a very typical expressions, not only in, um, in uh, this idea of a single medicine uh, of a panacea, it's very important idea in Dzogchen, but also in, uh, in Mahamudra uh, in Tibet. And then it talks about uh, discriminative wisdom without the duality between mindfulness and pure awareness. 
So those are very interesting uh, um, expressions about uh, the type of practice, uh, the type of mindfulness that is to be cultivated in Dzogchen practice. And now in the Longchen Nintik, he has also very beautiful uh, expressions to talk about um, Okay, so there is uh, the English is missing for the first one, so I'm going to translate it. So, tente drenpa dele gombochupa jao means it is enough to simply meditate with this mindfulness of the present. So, there is this idea that in this context, context of Dzogchen, this the present mind, the present mindfulness is the core. So, it also talks about the mindfulness of reflexive awareness, and reflexive awareness means one's own lipa here. He also talks about the natural, mindful, pure awareness, as well as the awareness of natural release and release. Natural release is what I, uh, I translated trekture as natural release. You could say breakthrough or uh, also total relaxation, according to Chigun Nam Kainabu Rinpoche. So here, Jigmin Ingpa talks about the awareness of natural release in the present. And he has this very beautiful expression. So sorry, the, the uh, English is missing. Uh, uh, so entering into the fortress of all encompassing mindfulness. So this is very, very beautiful. And of course, this all encompassing mindfulness is inseparable from Ligpa. Okay, so before we conclude uh, uh, with, uh, with Jigmen Ingpa, I wanted to offer uh, uh, um, a framework of how it defines levels of capacity for doctrine practice. So that we can make sense of how such uh, a distinctive uh, mindfulness uh, uh, of Dzogchen can be uh, actually implemented. So for high level practitioners, there is natural settling, no need for antidotes. For medium capacity practitioners, there is then the union of shamatha and vipassana, calm abiding and insight. But for low practitioners, and Jim Bedingpa was considering that most people were actually low uh, capacity practitioners, there is first calm abiding, then insight. And there are two uh, uh, approaches. Uh, one is peace instructions approach. First calm abiding, absence of thought, absence of thought movement. And then insight, recognition of thought movement. And this is very much how Chigel Nam Kainal Rinpoche has been teaching about uh, same day, for example, uh, ne and gu, and then uh, the inseparability of both. And then the lowest approach, so to speak, is a three wisdoms approach that I presented at the beginning. There is study, there is reflection, and then there is meditation, little by little. So I just wanted to uh, wrap up now at the level of Dzogchen, the different methods and different uh, levels of mindfulness uh, from, uh, again, the framework of Dzogchen according to Jigme Ingpa, as uh, taught in the Treasure of Qualities. So it will be now, um, uh, time uh, to conclude. Uh, so uh, in many ways, all what uh, I've been sharing today has been a footnote on uh, this uh, very uh, beautiful um, stanza in the introduction of the cycle of day and night that many of you uh, might be familiar with. Uh, this is my translation. This is not the official tr translation. Um, it's a bit rigid because I try really to follow the order of the Tibetan, which is quite old in English, but let me just uh, read it and uh, look how it does, does include all what we've been talking about. Always training the stream of consciousness with the four mind changers and not being at all separated from the yoga of knowing one's self-awareness as the master, being undistracted in the four activities, guarding mindfulness and awareness is a root of the yoga. So the first, uh, uh, um, the first lines to speak, always training the stream of consciousness with the four mind changers, refers to what we've seen, uh, renunciation, thinking about suffering, thinking about death, uh, thinking about this precious uh, human existence we have, karma, etc., etc. So always keeping this. So here the, the word, is very important always. So, so uh, this whole, uh, uh, the whole teaching, uh, the Buddhist teaching on mindfulness is that it's constant. It is to be constantly applied. 
So always keeping this. Uh, so, uh, so I've translated Lodok Namshi as a four mind changers uh, because they really doc is very strong, is to reverse, is to really like a switch, is to operate a revolution. So uh, really re realizing uh, uh, the suffering uh, 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 because generally we tend to. Uh, um, uh, we try to escape, right? So we have many, many escapist strategies. And this is what the French philosopher Pascal uh, coined divertissement. You know, we try to divert our attention from suffering, uh, divert our attention away from death, from the reality of, of, of our mortality. And here, the, the program, so to speak, is the opposite, is to confront oneself with this reality. And this, this operate a, 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 a complete a reorganization of priorities. And a priority is basically what uh, channel attention. So without such a reorganization of priorities, there is no possibility for us to practice something meaningful. So this is why this line is absolutely uh, central here. Always training the stream of consciousness, always training the mind with those four mind changes, those four awarenesses, especially uh, this. And then there is not being at all separated from the yoga of knowing one's self-awareness that is one's own lipa as the master. And of course, this refers to guru yoga as the, as the core practice uh, of Dzogchen. And especially in its essence as uh, recognizing one's own nature and I, I, as discovering and remaining in one's own nature. Um, but uh, this is not so easy. And what at least is to be done is then to be undistracted in the four activities. So the four activities are um, uh, sitting, standing, walking, and lying. So whatever uh, we might do day and night, remaining undistracted. And this non-distraction is clearly connected with guarding mindfulness and awareness. Those are really the two faculties that maintains such an undistracted state. And then uh, this uh, uh, whole, uh, and especially guarding mindfulness and awareness becomes the root or the foundation of yoga that, that is of the past, basically what is being taught. So I really, uh, 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 so, so, so again, uh, this whole talk was basically a long, long footnote uh, of this uh, uh, stanza. Uh, we've seen how uh, Long Chen Paz urged us uh, with those uh, elements as changing the mind and then recognizing the nature of mind and being undistracted and especially guarding. So again, the, the word uh, kyong here is quite strong in Tibetan. Um, so there are clearly uh, two levels. Uh, one is more effortful and one is more um, effortless. Um, but uh, the power of illusion is extremely strong. So it is clear uh, 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 that uh, this last sentence uh, um, uh, is very important and uh, it's very important to notice that uh, the final advice is to maintain uh, such presence and awareness. Okay, I will conclude here the talk so that we can have uh, time for uh, discussion. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much. And uh, everybody, please, if you have any questions, please just jump in. You can unmute yourself with the red button. And thank you, Mark, for this wonderful talk, really, about, we can say, the almost the essence of Buddhism, I would say, no? Yeah, yeah very much. Uh, this this quote by, uh, by uh, Chiken Namka Nobu is, is very essential. And it is the very beginning of the book, actually. Yeah? This is a very... Uh, it's one of the, uh, I think that's the third stanza at the very beginning. I see. And, uh, yeah. I don't see any questions, but I do have one actually. Yeah. Uh, would you say that this could be kind of seen, because I know in many Buddhist texts and lineages often sort of teachings are scattered. Several great masters, maybe they comment about some topic in their great collection of works and their sumbums. Yeah. But would you say that there's perhaps a lineage, as to say, of Drenpa, some continuous line that evolves, you know, from based on the previous master's 
philosophy or studies or text and then somebody comments on it what is there a continuous thread kind of thing that's my question yeah i see very much uh, uh and in the text that i that i'm uh, studying right now during past text all those is about small text you know there are like talks uh, like like advice he gave to to uh, to uh, to his students and and they were uh, written down and he he, he really like articulates everything He's talking about all the different meaning of mindfulness and awareness in the sutra level. I quote a lot the Shant uh, Shantideva, for example. And Shantideva uh, is actually maybe the, really, I think, one of the most important texts on Drenpa and Sheshin in a practical context, actually. And not only meditation, but really in a, as a whole uh, uh, life experience, basically. And, and uh, of course, this is one of the most fundamental texts in, in, in the whole Tibetan Buddhism. And especially uh, and now, Patrul um, Rinpoche um, uh, in 19th century was very famous uh, for having revived uh, the, the Bodhicharya Vatara. And he combined it with Dzogchen, actually. So, so this is made very much what we have today in this combination of the Sutra or Bodhicitta aspect of Drenpa and Shishin, the mindfulness and awareness, and then the Dzogchen approach. And, and, and because the Dzogchen approach is so subtle, and mistakes are so easy, uh, there is always a constant, like it's constantly being backed up with this uh, greed, you know, bodhicitta, greed, compassion, that is, that makes uh, then a very safe pass. Yeah. So I would say that basically, yeah, Shantideva would be really a, a, like a common uh, 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 stream uh, from Mahayana to Dzogchen, basically, and with people like Longchenpa. Or especially Patrul Rinpoche in the 19th century, who is very famous. He really revived uh, uh, this this work. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Can I ask a question? Yeah. This is Edith. Hello, Edith. <laughs> um, you've mentioned teachers quite often in your talk, and I know Norbu was the same. And I'm wondering more how to find teachers because we seem to have a lot of um, wonderful lectures like you and other people who help us with meditation but a teacher as such I find quite hard to understand maybe you could tell us a bit about finding yeah. teachers yeah that's that's a very uh, um, important question and um, um, yeah I think many uh, of the people <laughs> Many of the people connected with the Shangshung Institute were connected with, with Shogun Nam Kai Nobu, which is why I, I really refer to him today. Um, for those uh, who were connected to him, I'm sure there is many uh, 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 people who were trained uh, by him and that can help. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a very personal question, so it's very difficult to recommend somebody on Zoom uh, <laughs> as a, in a rather public uh, uh, talk. Um, um, there, I think. What I will recommend is that actually uh, uh, um, scriptures are also a way to uh, be in touch with teachers. Um, so for example, uh, in order to find a good teacher, uh, it's good to read, for example, Patrul Rinpoche's advice about how to recognize a good teacher. And how, because one is encouraged to examine very carefully uh, a teacher before one decides to follow her or him. So, so in Patrick Inpoche's uh, book, Words of My Perfect Teacher, uh, he has very interesting advice about how to identify a good teacher. And of course, one of the core elements is uh, bodhicitta, having this uh, altruistic motivation that the, the main motivation of the teacher is to really help others. It's not for self-benefit, it's to help others. So this is one of the core uh, uh, elements. So maybe reading reading that book by Patrick Impoches, and then maybe trying to follow different teachers and see see uh, who can fit. You can write the name of the book in the chat. Exactly. Yeah. Sure. Sure. The so words of my perfect teacher. So it was translated by uh, by uh, so it's by Patrick Impoche that I got it today, and it has been translated by. Uh, Padmakara, it's a very good translation. 
Thank you very much, Marc-Henri. Thank you very much for this very nice yeah. talk. Welcome. So it's very, what I, I, I just uh, want to make some uh, compliments, yeah. uh, not compliments, but compliments, like uh, <laughs> to emphasize the quality of what you say in, in the say, in the fact. What I think is very interesting is that it brings mindfulness uh, as a precise uh, spiritual uh, training, and as well as uh, the the basic of uh, of a culture of a culture yeah. of a civilization of a human uh, sense of life, mm -hmm. uh, and so that's very precious. I think in our a time where things are scattered, you know, and and brings things all about techniques and uh, yeah. and and uh, details. So now, so the, so I think it's very useful, and it is useful, I think, for the uh, mindfulness teachers. I think with this uh, this kind of approach, and especially what you mentioned about the memosic memosic or the greek uh, uh, memosia is very it's very interesting it, it brings also mindfulness not as a uh especially oriental or yeah. or, or, or asian uh, technique mm -hmm. but something that is universal and uh, so it and it's nice also to 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 listen to uh, this uh, jempa uh link to uh so the to the forgive forget um how you forgotness how would you say that lubli? Lubli? Forgetfulness. forgetfulness yes forgetfulness so and it's a very nice and poetic uh, uh and philosophical um topic because forgetfulness we are all forgetful forgetful of uh, um essential things all the time and uh, and so the recollection of the essential um, mm, heart of human being is a uh, is the core of, of uh, mindfulness practice so you you present that very very nicely thank you very much thank you yeah, so thank you very much. Mark, Mark, could I ask a question? Yes, please. Thank you for a brilliant talk, first of all. And I want to ask you a question about a slightly related topic, but I'm sure you won't mind. Um, obviously, you've talked about Buddhism's development from India and then yes. into, to, into through, through the Yanas and through the Dzogchen. I'm just wondering, um, how genuinely did the Vajrayana go to Japan? Now, I, I know you're... In Japan, in Kyoto, yes, I am. Yeah. yeah, so I'm really interested because I've been to Japan and I've seen some in Buddhist temples, some Buddhist temples, they've got the Vajrayana implements, the, the doje and the bell. Yeah. And I think there's some kind of like controversy about how genuine this this went, how genuinely it went to Japan. So please, no, I would say that is a very, very genuine tradition actually, and um, uh, it's quite actually striking that. Uh, Vajrayana, uh, especially uh, what we would call in Nyingma tradition, lower tantras, uh, uh, um, um, they were transmitted from India to China and immediately uh, some very famous Japanese monk, Do, uh, Kukai, uh, came to China and, and then went back to Japan. So the transmission was very quick from India to Japan. Uh, 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 really, really, in one century, uh, uh, Vajrayana was established in Japan uh, during Heian Jidai, so basically uh, uh, in the uh, 8th century, uh, if I'm correct, um, and uh, in a very, very precise way. And uh, uh, what uh, Japanese are really good at is at preserving traditions. They are really, really uh, good at uh, uh, being very rigorous, very, very meticulous. Um, then how uh, uh, vibrant this tradition is, this is another question. You know. Uh, uh, the challenge of modernity is huge. Uh, uh, modernity, you know, the, 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 this uh, uh, influence of technology, of new economic model, etc. They have changed the, 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 the entire planet and, and spiritual traditions have, you know, responded uh, to such a challenge in different way. Um, so I would not say that uh, this tradition is uh, 
very vibrant in Japan, uh, but it is clearly authentic and very, very genuine. And uh, for example, uh, uh, Kukai, this important uh, Japanese teacher who was trained in China, in China, but actually in Chang'an, so in Central Asia, almost in China, which is very like, mm. like he was exposed to many, many cultures and, and uh, uh, was a great mind. And uh, then he established uh, his seat in Mount Koya. So it's a very, very beautiful place if you have a chance to go uh, again in Japan and to, to visit there. And this is really, really wonderful. And I would say that sometimes we have the idea that uh, Japan is Zen. Uh, uh, like there is this idea because Zen is very important in the West. But I would say that Japanese Buddhist culture as a whole is very tantric, actually. Uh, Why is that? Uh, yeah, tantric rituals, at least like what we call lower tantras in the Nyingma school, they are very, very important for, for um, all schools, actually. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks. Do we have any other questions? If we I have a question. Yeah. I'd like to uh, thank you very much for your presentation. And you could, uh, we could stop at any of your slides and spend a whole <laughs> session on, on each of them. Um, what, what would be your aspiration of uh, how you'd like to see uh, mindfulness, uh, secular mindfulness develop um, in a way so that it would stay uh, authentic and um, uh, true to the uh, to, to the uh, tradition, uh, well, what 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 do you what would you like to see happen? Yes, thank you. Um, it's a very difficult question, but so maybe one suggestion that that I have made actually in the in the paper, uh, if we um, con conceptualize mindfulness according to the three wisdoms, then there is clearly something to be learned and remembered. Uh, so even when we take very basic uh, um, meditation for stress reduction, for example, there is a model of stress reaction versus response that is being taught. And that actually, this is an element of learning. And if this is being memorized, and it is memorized uh, somehow, this has an effect. So being aware of how it is important to memorize ethical categories, or this is also known uh, now in psychology as psychoeducation, so in order to to help uh, patients or help people, like just like telling them about the mind, you know, what it, how does it work? You know, what are the different aspects of the mind? So I think this is really, really important. And this is to be learned and memorized. And then one should also encourage self-reflection. I think that like, self-reflection is so important. And sometimes in the West, we, we, uh, we tend to see, uh, especially in Buddhist communities, uh, we tend to see uh, uh, concepts are bad. You know, we should not have concepts because concept is, is dualistic, etc. But actually, there is a major difference between a chaotic succession in concepts in the mind and a rigorous, articu rigorously articulated way of thinking. And this is basically the Western tradition of logos. This is what philosophia is in ancient Greek, ancient Greek philosophy. So, so I think. Uh, uh, first, like uh, insisting on, on learning and, and psychoeducation, learning how the mind works. And this is it. when uh, secular mindfulness based intervention work, they work well because they do that, actually. because they do that. And uh, so one way is psychoeducation, and then it's, it's, it's encouraging self reflection, uh, 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 clear reflection. And this is very, very powerful. And, and reading is very important, uh, reading philosophy, I think. Is important and and I've read that in, in uh, a book on the history of psychology in the 19th century people in uh, uh, will encourage uh, patients to read stoic philosophy because stoic philosophy will teach this, this sense of self-determination self-reliance and this constant uh, emphasis on uh, well actually attentiveness and vigilance in, in, in terms that are very very close to, to mindfulness so that's one thing and then we could have of course, uh, uh, cultivating a direct presence of mind, not just living in the head, but just experiencing the world as it is. And this is very, very important. Um, but I'm saying this because over the years, 
I've been more and more concerned about the impact of digital technologies uh, and the power of images. And images are very, very, um, emotionally speaking, images are very, very strong. They have a huge impact. So it's now proven that even just TV, forget about smartphone and, and, and Zoom and internet, just TV in front, in, from the 50s and 60s, TV had uh, uh, the tendency to uh, uh, decrease the capacity for conceptual articulated reflection. So we are already having the tendency to just have quickly judge, quickly respond to an image, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, an icon, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's quite kind of important to keep the sense of critical distance, uh, discerning, making clear distinctions. Uh, so that we can maintain our, our freedom, I would say, our autonomy. Uh, uh, so it's really a, a question of balance. But this, so of course, like direct experience, uh, embodied uh, 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 mindfulness is all very important to maintain balance, not just to live in the head, but also uh, learning clear categories and, and reflecting critical thinking is also very, very essential. And this, is, this could be adapted in a secular way, basically. And, and, and then in this, in this end, I think uh, Greek philosophy or Stoic philosophy can be also very good uh, uh, materials to read. Yeah. Do we have any last questions? I'd just like to say thank you for that last comment, Mark, really, because the sort the the, the mixture of um, of search engine algorithms and particularly yeah. children's development just seems to be absolutely kind of um, quite a toxic mix. You know, children sort of particularly seem to get addicted to these digital um, visual stimuli. And um, so, yeah, point taken. I think it's um, it seems to be the antithesis of of development of mindfulness, having yeah. having um, digital media for children sometimes. Yeah. So 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 that's 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 exactly the case. And actually, uh, uh, so let's just take TV. And if this is true for TV, you can imagine, you know, how tragic is is the situation now. So actually, TV it tends to um, uh, over, uh, you know. Uh, how you say in English, hypertrophy? Do you say this in English? You know, hyperdevelop, overdevelop. Uh, mm -hmm. or visual attention. And visual attention is very much like a bottom-up system. So we tend to constantly um, notice new stimuli, right? New stimuli. But uh, study or any learning instrument or music or any you know, structured activity uh, uh, is actually uh, um, uh, necessitating a, a top-down approach by which you ignore irrelevant stimuli. So this is what it means to be undistracted. So basically, by indulging in TV consumption, we train our mind and brain to be distracted, to be unable to ignore irrelevant stimuli, just because they are rewarding. So it, it teaches basically passive reward for quick, quick reward and quick pleasure. So it's very, very tragic, because actually, this is not the highest happiness that human beings are able to attain. It's the opposite, actually, learning an instrument learning mathematics, poetry, requires discipline, focus, ignoring other stimuli. But in the end, and of course, meditation is the ultimate uh, discipline in a sense. But in the end, this is highly rewarding. And we have the whole psychology of concentration in Buddhism that teaches us joy and happiness. This is what emerges where the mind becomes self-collected. And this is not only in, in deep meditation, but this is the case uh, uh, in reading philosophy, in playing piano, even in speaking with friends, like a conversation is a certain art. There is a certain, you know, when it worked well, it, it requires skills, actually. You have to be skills in skilled in conversation. And, and, and this is actually what TV and other forms of uh, passive conceptions uh, bringing quick reward is affecting. And this is highly um, 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 problematic because uh, once this capacity uh, uh, is lost, is basically the capacity for self-control, for self-determination, 
and basically for mental health and mental balance, self-regulation basically. So this is one of the most uh, important uh, quality uh, that we have to develop. And I think today, uh, this is my hope that I've really emphasized how Buddhist teachers have constantly been teaching uh, such a fundamental skill. And we need it, we need it more than ever. But we need, it, uh, we need it uh, uh, in a culturally embodied way. Not just doing meditation and then with the uh, app and then going to, <laughs> it's that stuff. We need to be, yes, we need to re maybe redesign lifestyle yeah. mindfully. Thank you, Mark. Very wise words at the end also. And hopefully somebody will come up with some good system, perhaps in the educational system yeah. even really train because as you say it is very important nowadays so thank you so much it was a wonderful lecture great historical overview so really thank you so much